Fab. So if you have a look at women in the Odyssey, you'll notice that they crop up structurally quite regularly throughout the epic. At the beginning, we start to meet characters like Penelope and Eurycleia back home in Ithaca, when Homer's really priming us for what's at stake. So why does Odysseus need to get home? What's the impetus? If you have a look throughout the middle, you're going to see the Wanderings, and this is where we meet Circe and Calypso, who we'll talk about today. And these are quite unusual women. So they don't live in an embedded community. They don't have an oikos, a household. They don't have a kurios, a male caretaker. So they're really kind of uh, unusual women and therefore supernatural women because they live outside of the rules of the Homeric world. And then right at the very end, we come back to Ithaca and we meet Eurycleia again and we meet Penelope again. Um, so either end of the Odyssey, you have women who belong to very ordered worlds. And in the middle, you have women who belong to disordered worlds. Um, we also have Nausicaa coming up right in the middle, who is kind of in between. I'm going to talk a bit more about that today. There's also now the first translation in English by a woman of the Odyssey. So it's quite an interesting time to be looking at this as a theme. And I'll give you a bit more of a reading list or a bit of summer reading that could be quite interesting for you at the end of today. So one of the key, key women we think about when we start to look at the Odyssey is Calypso. Calypso comes up in our first encounter with Odysseus. So when we meet Odysseus, all our expectations of him, what we think of him as a hero, is really framed by how he reacts and interacts with Calypso. So Calypso is a sort of demigoddess. She's living in isolation on an island. And Calypso provides an early um, example of Xenia. So Xenia, or hospitality, um, hospitality not just in general, but to strangers in particular, is really, really important throughout the epic. And Calypso provides an early example of this. We've seen this with the suitors and Penelope in book one and in the Telemachy. And now we're going to see how people deal with Odysseus and what the dangers are when Xenia does not really go well. So Calypso is an example of quite bad Xenia. Not because she doesn't feed water and look after Odysseus, but because she keeps him for too long. So a really important part of Xenia is not forcing or compelling your guests to overstay their welcome. You should let them go. You should enable them to move on. And Calypso fails to do this. She's quite an imposing figure. And throughout today, I've thought about who I would cast. This is a really useful way to read a text like the Odyssey. Have a casting call and think, who would I cast? if I was cast in the role of Calypso. So my choice was Charlize Theron because of Snow White and the Huntsman and this kind of um, really regal, supernatural, aloof woman is how I imagine Calypso when I'm reading the epic. So she's the person I have in mind when I'm reading about Hermes visiting Calypso and I'm thinking about Calypso detaining Odysseus. And if we have a close look at some of the text, we can see Calypso's reply to Hermes. So when Hermes is sent down to compel Calypso to let Odysseus go, she starts to really stand her ground and she's quite firm with Hermes. So she says that the gods are cruel because, to be honest, it's a double standard. <laughs> and she points out that lots of other goddesses fall in love with mortal men. It is not unusual for a goddess to fall in love with a mortal man and the gods are kind of singling her out as an example. She's making it really, really clear as well that she has saved Odysseus. So she's staking her claim from her point of view. Her hospitality is good. She saved him when he was all alone and when he was caught up in the storm. And we can see that in bold at the very, very end of the passage. She also does a lovely bit of foreshadowing because the structure of the Odyssey, as you might know by now, is quite weird. It jumps forward and backwards and part of it is narrated by Odysseus himself. So Calypso makes clear in this exchange with Hermes that um, she doesn't have ships and oars and that basically Odysseus has come to her on his own. So we see at the beginning of the passage, all the rest of his noble comrades perished. So it's a spoiler alert, really. We know that Odysseus' journey home is not going to go well. And that's something that's been made clear from the Council of the Gods in book one. Um, and it's being reiterated now that we're meeting Calypso. And this goes back to something that you might have looked at for your scholarship on the A-level course, the Homeric question. The big Homeric question is, was the Odyssey composed by one person, aka Homer, in a really clear order? Or was it stitched together from lots of different retellings? 
by having Calypso quite early on saying that Odysseus has lost all his men, it gives us a sense of foreboding because we know that when we hear about the wanderings, a lot of Odysseus's men will die. It puts Odysseus in our minds because we meet him with Calypso as the, the only hero that we're really focused on. And think what a contrast that is. <laughs> Sorry, Nemesis what... come in and just pulled all of our leads. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, mate. <laughs> you all right? She's fine. <laughs> no, that's all right. So we were just talking about Homer and Calypso. That's where we're up to. So we, we were just thinking about this contrast. We've got this focal point of Homer's um, character Odysseus and Calypso, whereas for an audience who've listened to the Iliad, the Iliad's really cluttered isn't it? There's lots of heroes in the Iliad. They're all chatting all the time. There are lots of war councils. There are lots of heroes to keep track of. And this epic's a real contrast because it focuses on just the one person in the narrative order because it introduces us to Odysseus on his own first. So looking at the way Calypso comes early and tells us all the other uh, comrades are dead can help you link back and think about that Homeric question. Is this like a really good fantasy film that flashes backwards and forwards and primes us for different things? Or is it simply in a weird order because lots of different performers stitched it back together? Um, Odysseus's perspective on Calypso comes up later as well. So thinking about Calypso and Odysseus' relationship sets up expectations of how reliable Odysseus is. And that's going to come up as a question for you guys all the way through your Odyssey course when we see Odysseus narrating um, different parts of his story. Do we really trust him as a narrator? If so, why? And if not, why not? So Odysseus gives us his opinion on Calypso later on. And actually, quite a lot of it adds up. So the, a lot of the things that we saw the um, epic narrator put forward earlier on, Odysseus confirms. So actually, when Odysseus is in book seven with the Phaeacians and he's telling them about Calypso, in the initial part of his description, he's actually quite reliable, which is most unlike Odysseus. So he says that um, gods or mortals don't have anything to do with her. That's true. We know she's on an island on her own, and we know that Hermes is sort of shunted down to go and see her. You know, we know that she's a dread goddess and that she's quite imposing, and that's you know completely stacking up with the description of her in the cave when Hermes comes down. We know that she's had a good go at some Xenia, <laughs> but she's not done it quite right. She's kept him too long. So she took me to her home with kindly welcome and gave me food. Fantastic. Fine. And we see that Odysseus isn't clear on the exchange between Hermes and Calypso. So either because of some message from Zeus or because her own mind was turned, she eventually let me go. So actually, the, the comparison between Odysseus's account of Calypso and our encounter with her it can tell us something about the Homeric question. It can make us think about the role of women, but it also tells us something about Odysseus as a narrator. He is actually more reliable than we might think before he starts talking about his wanderings, at least. And it all really adds up to that image we had of her at the beginning. If we look at Circe, we've got actually a very similar figure in lots of respects. She brings in the theme of hospitality again, which comes up time and time and time again. And we know that that goes a little bit wrong, or very, very wrong, because this is before he meets Calypso. This is when he has his men, and they are turned into pigs. Hopefully, some of you may have already read Circe, <laughs> the Madeline Miller adaptation. And this is lovely because it shows us things from Circe's point of view. It really reminds us that she is quite an isolated figure. So on her island, she has her own rules. She lives her own kind of lifestyle. And like Calypso, there is no kurios, no male caretaker, and there is no oikos. So when we think about Circe, the person I would have cast for this, I thought about Maleficent and Angelina Jolie. And again, thinking about your casting call, who would you have for different figures and why? Circe is a more, in some ways, a more insidious or a more scary figure than Calypso because she uses witchcraft on the men and because she is quite merciless in the way that she seems to do that. And again, Hermes gets in, involved. Um, so when Hermes is warning Zisius about Circe, when he gives him the moly, the holy moly, um, we get this clear impression of Circe as an imposing threat. So he says to Odysseus, where are you going? What are you doing, basically? And then he gives him this potent herb, the mole. 
and says, this will ward away evil. So he's trying to get Odysseus to use his cunning, to use his wiles, and to use his divine support to get around um, the witchcraft of Circe. So Hermes primes Odysseus on exactly how to deal with Circe, what to take, what to do, how to speak, because we know that she's a dangerous threat. And again, I mentioned at the beginning of today's talk, at either end of the Odyssey, we have very ordered worlds. So very early on in the Telemachy, we meet Penelope. And although she, obviously things aren't quite right because the suitors are there, she belongs to the world Odysseus is returning to. She is the kind of good wife. We have the nurse Eurycleia. She is a good nurse. They are good women. And then in the middle, we have these supernatural women who really challenge a lot of values from the Homeric world. They live on their own. They're not supervised. And usually Hermes has to intervene to tell them what to do because there's nobody there to naturally check them and because they're not living by anybody else's standards. And that's why they belong to the chaos that comes in the middle of the epic. So from Odysseus's perspective, this is what the timeline would look like. And we thought about this a little bit just a moment ago when we were talking about the Homeric question. So we have 10 years of the Trojan War. We have a couple of years for, for the Wanderings. So the Wanderings are really action-packed. Things are going wrong pretty much every six weeks to a month in the Wanderings. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just one of those years where everything goes wrong and we've all had one of them. Um, <laughs> Yeah, let's be honest. And then seven to eight years, just with Calypso alone. Just with Calypso. So if you think about the timeline and how old Telemachus would be, um, because the Telemachy is kind of happening at roughly the same time here. That's why we get this impression of Telemachus as an adolescent, yeah? And then finally, everything happens really, really quickly. So once he leaves Calypso, everything clicks into place. But we're told all of this in flashback. So quite disordered, um, but also gives us that foreshadowing we looked at when we looked at Calypso, gives us a sense of threat and the sense of challenge as well, which is so important to Odysseus's nostos, to Odysseus's homecoming. Um, it makes the homecoming feel really satisfying. But you'll probably have noticed as well that in the, the way that the epic is split up, the homecoming takes quite a long time. It takes up quite a, a, a number of books within the epic because the details of how he kind of puts himself back in the household are so, so important. Right, let's go for somebody a bit tamer then and think about Nausicaa. Nausicaa is a bit of a Marmite character, I think. I think some people like her because she's very, very sweet and some people really dislike her because she's probably a bit too sweet and a bit irritating, for a modern reader at least. Nausicaa provides another example of hospitality. So... She is the one who intercepts Odysseus by the shore. She has no concept of stranger danger at all. Athena has made her bold. Athena has sent her messages in a dream. And now Sakea goes to do her laundry, because I'm sure that's what you all do when you wake up and you've had a weird dream. You think, wow, it's time to do some laundry and meet a husband. And that's what now Sakea does. <laughs> She's very different from Circe and Calypso because she lives in an ordered world, or at least a, a somewhat ordered world. She has a Corios, her father, Alcinous. She has a caretaker. She has an Oikos. She's sleeping in a palace when we meet her. She runs out with all her maids. So she's part of a very elaborate social structure. When she's down by the shoreline doing a laundry, her maids are there and they're playing with a the ball, they're playing catch, which shows their naivety and their age. If we were to compare Nausicaa to any other character, um, we could fairly compare it to Telemachus, actually. Because like Telemachus, she is at that coming of age time in her life where she's kind of trying to observe the, um, the kind of social mores or the social expectations of her world and kind of falling short in some respects and not quite getting it right. And that's everything we've seen Telemachus do. So again, it's reminding us of the Telemachy and reminding us of what's at stake for Odysseus. When I think of Nausicaa, I don't know if you guys have seen Game of Thrones. This was my lockdown, basically, re-watching this. It makes me think always of Sansa Stark. So a very sweet character, a very young girl who dreams of getting married, has no idea what getting married would actually be like, doesn't think about what it would be like to join another household, 
and have another uh, man be your kurios, i.e. your husband and not your dad. Um, and, you know, he's very sweet and endearing, but really naive. And at that, that kind of time in her life. So when Odysseus meets Nausicaa, he really turns on a charm offensive. And you've probably clocked this already. So he says, I clasp your knees, my queen. Are you a goddess or are you a mortal? And if we look at the vase picture, there's really no, <laughs> there's no comparison, is there, between Athena in the middle and Nausicaa, the sweet young girl on the right. Um, you know, she has a diadem because she's the princess of Scyria, but there's no mistaking Nausicaa for a goddess, really. It's a, a heavy-handed charm offensive. So again, much like when we saw Odysseus's reflections on Calypso, when Odysseus meets Nausicaa, that tells us something about his character. When we saw Odysseus describe Calypso, we realised he's quite a reliable narrator in some respects. And now we see Odysseus encounter Nausicaa. We're meeting Odysseus, Polutropos, wily Odysseus, Odysseus of the many geysers, who can blend in a total kind of social chameleon, who can blend in wherever he is. And he's really turning on the charm. What he also does about halfway through this passage is he realises that he needs to meet the family. So he says, thrice blessed then are your father and your honoured mother, and thrice blessed are your brothers. So he's bringing the family into the conversation, because let's be frank, now is not going to give him any ships, she's not going to give him any help. Odysseus needs to wheedle his way in and meet the family, and he's finding a nice way of talking around. And this kind of comes to a very suggestive end, where he says... But that man in his turn is blessed in heart above all others. He shall prevail with his gifts of wooing. And I love these translations. Wooing, I'm sure we all say that. And lead you to his home. So um, this idea of a husband or a kurios comes back in. And it's quite flirty and quite suggestive. I wouldn't write flirty in exams. Maybe suggestive would be better. But he's really <laughs> wooing her, yeah? He's coming on quite strong. He's already pretty much naked, which is bold. Um, and Athena at this point has made him tall and shiny because apparently that's, you know, the hallmark of an attractive man in the Greek world. Got to make him a bit taller and a bit shinier. So we're really meeting Odysseus for what he is. And we wouldn't get that if we didn't have Nausicaa in the middle. But the scene in Scaria brings up again another theme, and we've seen Zenyu coming up with Circe, we've seen Zenyu coming up with Calypso, we're seeing it again with Nausicaa, because Nausicaa represents expectations of women in the Homeric world in a way that Calypso and Circe don't. So Nausicaa is trying to do the right thing and doing it in a bit of a dodgy way. She wants to get married, she wants a new Kurios, Athena has visited her, which again, tells us you've got the maiden goddess visiting you. That's a, a mark of quality. You know, it's not just a reflection on Odysseus that Athena talks to Nausicaa. The fact that Nausicaa is visited by Athena and is comfortable with it tells us that Nausicaa is to a maiden. Um, and what we get really from Nausicaa are some very, very detailed, very detailed instructions on how to enter the household. Now, I asked my students the other day, what are the do's and don'ts in your house? And if you were priming somebody to meet your parents, what, what would you say? And people were coming up with, I don't know if you guys have got this, don't put your feet on the sofa. Take your shoes off at the door. My dad's a bit awkward. Talk to my mum first. And this is all now is doing. It's that teenage thing of my parents are a bit odd. Uh, this is how to go about it. And that's what Nausicaa does. So she tells Odysseus to pass her father by. This is huge. This is so unusual. And for a Homeric audience, this would really stick out like a sore of thumb. Because the man of the house should be receiving guests. It's his house. He is the kurios of the oikos, the caretaker of the household. So to snub the man of the house is quite a big deal in a way that for us it's perhaps not. She tells him to throw his arms about her mother's knees. Fair enough, he's just done that with Nausicaa. Um, and she's basically saying, go around my dad and talk to my mum. So very, very unusual. She's suggesting that her mum has all the power. She says, you know, if you do this, you will quickly, with rejoicing, see the day of your return, though you have come never so far. Um, if you win her favour, there is hope you will see your people and will return to your well-built house and to your native land. So 
really, you know, she's suggesting that her mum has all the power. And this links in with some scholarship you might have looked at for the A-level. So Rose argues the case that the Phaeacians' hospitality is not friendly. His article is The Unfriendly Phaeacians. Um, and for a very long time, people thought that because Nausicaa wasn't Circe and wasn't Calypso, she provided some really positive examples of hospitality and a bit of a respite, actually, from all the trauma that Odysseus has suffered so far. But really, what we see is a kind of distorted hospitality scene. OK, she's not turning them into pigs, but it's still a bit weird that she's met him whilst doing a laundry and telling him to avoid a dad. There's something about that that still doesn't quite add up. Um, and if you know much about the Phaeacians in the Odyssey, we'll know that they used to live near the Cyclopes, the Cyclops, and they moved in order to, well, I mean, you would move, wouldn't you, if you live next to the Cyclopes? It just uh, answers itself. But they moved and then became quite an insular society. So they're not actually very open. They're not that friendly to strangers. And Athena warns Odysseus about this. So now Sakea is his ticket in. Against all of this, we have Penelope. We meet Penelope at the very beginning. And because of the weird structure that we talked about, when we looked at the Homeric question, this provides what I would call a foil. So a foil is like a basis of comparison, something that makes everything else a bit clearer. By meeting Penelope first, we compare every woman we meet afterward to Penelope. Calypso is definitely not Penelope. She's clever, she's wily, she's good at, I suppose, keeping Odysseus, but she's also a bit frightening and a bit, dare I say, a bit crazy in love, isn't she, really? I mean, <laughs> she's, she's not... Um, a kind of stabilising figure. She's not a mother, she's not a wife, she's living outside society. We could say the same of Circe. Every woman we meet after Penelope in the Telemache, we compare to Penelope. So we've got this background noise of Penelope all the way through the epic because we meet her first and because actually, to be fair, we meet her before Odysseus. So Penelope and Odysseus are a couple that you're rooting for because of the way that the Odyssey is structured. And because there seems to be a big hole in Ithaca where Odysseus should be. And that's something that's really important to the Telemachy. Now, that's not necessarily in your prescribed books. You read book one, you go to book five. But it's a thread that kind of runs throughout. And because we read book one, we look at Penelope quite a bit. For Penelope, I always think of the good wife. Genuinely, because that's how I have her in my mind's eye. And in book one of the Odyssey, we actually have an impression of her that is very much like this. We know her husband's in the background, but we see Penelope as more than just an extension of Odysseus. We actually meet her in her own right as a mother. And Telemachus is quite critical of her. So depending on whether you were an ancient audience, a modern audience, you could read that as Telemachus being a bit ungrateful and a bit brattish, um, and it could make you root for Penelope more. Or you could kind of wonder and look into why Penelope does the sneaky things she does. So we can see in the vase painting, for example, that Penelope's weaving the famous shroud for Laertes, her father-in-law, and she's going to unpick it at night. But even when Penelope's being bad, she's still kind of being good. What a get-out-of-jail card is that? Oh, I'm, you know, I've got to honour my existing husband's dad. I've got to honour my father-in-law. It's such a brilliant excuse. But in a way, it's one that makes her appeal to the suitors even more because she's a good woman. She's an honourable woman doing an honourable thing. She's given them an excuse that nobody can argue with and her son might not be of an age to really understand or appreciate it, but that doesn't mean that it's not valid and that it's not important. The other thing that this offers to the Odyssey is this idea of homophrosune. So Penelope and Odysseus are very like-minded. That is what homophrosune means. Odysseus as a character would have this reputation anyway from the Iliad. So when we meet Odysseus in the Iliad, he brokers situations. He is an excellent speaker. He comes up with great lies to, <laughs> to try and get people back together. And he is addressed and spoken to as wily Odysseus. Even in the Iliad, when somebody very, very respected, like Nestor, speaks, 
they will send Odysseus to do something or they will invite Odysseus to speak because that is his strength and that is what Odysseus is known for. So in the Odyssey, we have that expectation of Odysseus already. We have it in his epithets like Polytropos or Wily Odysseus or Cunning Odysseus. And how exciting for a reader to meet his wife, who they've perhaps not met um, before, who's not referenced so much in the Iliad, and have her be a female counterpart of him. She's cooked up a really cunning plan. She's playing push and pull with the suitors because she knows she's in a dangerous position. She's quite similar to Odysseus in that she doesn't fight outwardly. She's a strategist and she's very tactical. And so although Telemachus might not get it because, you know, most of us argue with our mums, the listener would get it because they know Odysseus. So we've met his perfect counterpart before we meet Odysseus himself. And that might mean that when, for example, an ancient audience meets Calypso and learns that Odysseus isn't quite in love with the goddess, they might be less sceptical than we are. So for modern readers, when we meet Calypso and we know that Odysseus has been having this affair with a goddess and he's crying on the shore, you're probably thinking, well, just behave yourself. You've been having this affair with a goddess for seven years. I'm not having it. Um, you're obviously not faithful to your wife. You know, by modern standards, the Calypso episode is really hard to, to kind of get your head around. But for an ancient audience, think that they're both in difficult positions. Penelope is doing what she needs to do to survive with the suitors. And actually, to be fair, Odysseus is doing the same. I find the Calypso episode hard because I am a modern reader, but an ancient reader might not have done. And seeing this distinction is so important, particularly for your assessments, when you're thinking about your exams, ancient audience versus modern audience. It's a great, um, it's a great excuse, actually, to look at women in the Odyssey, because ancient and modern views are always going to be so, so different from one another. So Penelope, when we get to the end of the Odyssey and we get this extended um, homecoming, this Nostos, which takes up a number of books, Penelope requests to see the stranger in book 17. And we have this strange, not quite recognition scene. So she's waiting in the hall. She's asking for um, an audience with this stranger. And she's, again, making it very open and transparent. She's not meeting him in secret. So she is being well-behaved, according to her employees. And she's trying to observe some level of hospitality. So we can see this reference to food and clothing. She's sending the swineherd to um, bring the stranger in. So she's actually having um, somebody chaperone, if you want to view it that way. So she's doing everything above board and she's trying to accommodate a stranger. And she unwittingly kind of agrees with the stranger. So she's reconnecting with Odysseus before she even knows he's there. Not without wisdom is the stranger. He divines how it may be, for I suppose there are no mortal men who in their insolence devise such wicked folly as these. So, the way that Penelope and Odysseus seem to connect with one another before they even meet is right there in book 17. And it's details like this that account for the length of Odysseus's return. He has to use everything he's learnt so far through Troy and through his wanderings to get into his own household safely and to end with his wife and his son alive. So it's a really delicate kind of insurgent job <laughs> to get back into his own house at the end of the epic because he's outnumbered by the suitors. So much like Penelope with the shroud, the way that Odysseus returns in disguise, the way that Odysseus uses that to get back in, it shows that they are like-minded and it brings us back to that key word, Homophrosune. So homos is the same, frosune is mindedness or thoughtfulness. And that is a really important keyword whenever you're talking about their relationship. Another lovely moment comes up in book 18 when Penelope quotes Odysseus, not a recent thing that Odysseus has said, but she remembers the words or claims to remember the words that Odysseus said before he ever went to Troy. Now in the trial of the bow, Odysseus is, is there. 
So right in front of him, she remembers what Odysseus said before he left. And apparently it runs something like this. Wife, I do not think that the well-grieved Achaeans will all return from Troy safe and unscathed. For the Trojans, they say, are men of war, hurlers of the spear and drawers of the bird and drivers of swift horses such as most quickly decide the great strife of evil war therefore i do not know whether the god will bring me back or whether i shall be cut off there in the land of troy so let all here be your care be mindful of my father and my mother in the halls even as you are now or yet more while i am far away but when you shall see my son a bearded man wed whom you will and leave your house so there are two audiences for this There are the suitors who are hearing what they want to hear from it and hearing that eventually Penelope will have permission when the time is right to remarry. And then there's Odysseus. He's remembering this poignant moment from when he left for Troy. And so Penelope is, again, masterful in the way that she presents a speech. She's just like Odysseus in the way that she is able to manipulate and tell people what they think they want to hear and what they think they need to hear. And we've always got this balancing act between how genuine are Odysseus and Penelope and how much should we mistrust them. And often when we read scholarship or when we listen to podcasts or we we read more widely, we're encouraged to be quite cynical about it. But a good way of looking at it could also be that they're both survivors. Penelope is the survivor at home. She's a, you know, she's a military wife. Odysseus is the survivor abroad. And they're both using their skills to be reunited so although they're doing things that are very cunning and very underhanded things that we might not think of as being very moral or very heroic they have a good outcome and they have a quite a genuine and quite a a wholesome purpose to reunite a family and who wouldn't want to see that and having read the telemache who's not rooting for them so after penelope speaks uh we see this reaction So she's summing up what Odysseus has said in the first bullet point. So he spoke, and now all this is being brought to pass. The night shall come when a hateful marriage shall fall to the lot of me accursed, whose happiness Zeus has taken away. So Penelope is making clear that even though she's got a duty to Odysseus, even though she's going to remarry because he's told her to, she still loves him. And that's, you know, something that's really, really poignant. Because not all marriages, according to homeric values, would be for love. Look at Helen, look at Clytemnestra, and we're often encouraged to do that in the Odyssey. You know, we have these comparisons coming up with Helen of Troy, who disappeared off with Paris, <laughs> to put it nicely. We have these comparisons with Clytemnestra, who, when Agamemnon returned from the Trojan War, killed him and had, you know, shacked up with his cousin, I guess this. And in contrast to all of that, we have Penelope, who's so similar to her husband and who we've been rooting for from the very beginning because of the structure of the epic and because we're meeting women all the way through who just don't measure up to Penelope in lots of ways. So she spoke, and much enduring noble Odysseus was glad because he drew from them gifts and beguiled their souls with winning words. But her mind was set on other things. So we can see the the strategy that's coming through as well in the trial of the bow. Okay, so the last lady I want to talk about today, talk about today before I give you some suggested reading and we have some time for questions, is really easy to miss, actually, and that is Eurycleia. Now, Eurycleia becomes very important at the end, and you can possibly see this recognition between Odysseus and Eurycleia in the vase painting. Now, the Greek word for recognition is anagnoresis. I'm not sure if you guys are studying the tragedy module. If you are, this will come up in that as well. But Eurycleia facilitates Odysseus re-entering the household. She is the one who tells Penelope that she thinks Odysseus has returned. And she's a really important figure because not only does she come up at the end, that's where we think about her most, but she is a minor character at the beginning. So she's always there as part of the furniture, really, part of the household. And if we think about Nostos... Eurycleia is one of the things that makes a house a home. She is one of the key figures that makes Odysseus' house feel like part of his home. Like Penelope, like um, Telemachus, like all the different bits of furniture we hear about the suitors using 
a bit like Odysseus's dog when he runs up to him. So all these little details make Ithaca feel homely. And Euryclea is a key figure who makes a house a home. I always think of Mrs Weasley all the time when I think of Euryclea. Really sweet, adorable, maternal figure. And although Euryclea in the Odyssey is a slave, she has a totally different status from that. Um, remember, slaves in the ancient world can be valued as members of the family. It's really unusual and different from other um, historical periods when you're looking at slavery, and it's generally quite insidious. I'm sure there was a lot of that. However, in the Odyssey, Euryclea is part of the family. She's really integrated and really important. She provides a, a maternal figure for Odysseus, even though she's not his mum. And I always think of Mrs Weasley when I think of Euryclea. So you can think of Euryclea as a very maternal figure. And what's unique about her is she's one of the few women in the Odyssey who is never a love interest for Odysseus. So Calypso is a temptress. Circe is a seductress. Nausicaa is dying for Odysseus to marry her because that's part of her, her kind of fantasy for her next few years of life. She wants a husband. And Penelope is the wife that we're waiting for all along. But Euryclea is a lovely figure because she's, she's not really a love interest for him, but she's part of what makes his house a home. And we hear this in book one. We have this really clear impression of who Euryclea is and what her status is from the beginning. But it's just quite easy to miss because we're so distracted by Telemachus. So true-hearted Euryclea, lovely epithet, um, has a really detailed backstory. So Laertes had bought with his wealth when she was in her first youth and gave for her the price of 20 oxen and honoured her even as he honoured his faithful wife in his halls. But he never lay with her in love, for he avoided the wrath of his wife. She it was uh, who bore for Telemachus the blazing torches, for she of all the handmaids loved him most and nursed him when he was a child. So the role that the nurses play in the house are very personal. When it says she nursed him, she might have been genuinely a wet nurse. She could have been a wet nurse for him, we don't know, which means she would have breastfed him. She might have been a bit old for that with Telemachus. She could have certainly done that for Odysseus. Um, and she's really integrated. Again, Laertes and his wife don't have the marriage that Penelope and Odysseus do. You know, Laertes is married to somebody because of her status, but actually really has this close and personal connection with Euryclea. And it reiterates how unique it is for Penelope and Odysseus to have the marriage that they have, that has both. It's a good match for all the practical reasons, but it's also a love match, and that's something that's quite unique to them. So Euryclea is a figure of importance from the very beginning, and she's part of Ithaca. You can't have Ithaca without Euryclea. We see this in the familiarity between the women as well, because Euryclea speaks to um, Penelope quite openly, even though she's of a completely different status. Um, and Penelope's very, very sceptical. So Euryclea flags to Penelope that she thinks that Odysseus has returned. And Penelope <laughs> replies and thinks she's losing her mind. No, come now, go down and back to the woman's hall, for if any other of the women that are mine had come and told me this and had roused me out of my sleep, for that I would speedily have sent her back again to the hall in a manner she would not like. But to you, old age shall bring this profit. So she's getting a special treatment, Euryclea is, because she is an older member of the household. And they're all hanging about together, never lose sight of the fact that in a Greek household there's a women's quarters where the women are together and taught together. And if you want an insight into what that might have been like, read some of the classical fiction that I'm going to flag for you at the end, where we get really domestic scenes of women weaving or preparing medicines and chatting about what the men are up to. So the relationship between the women is really well pitched, even if we don't see it all the time in the Odyssey. On a more sinister note, we have the maids. I mentioned at the very beginning of today that at either end of the Odyssey, we have the women who belong to ordered worlds and the women who belong to disordered worlds. And the nurses are purged because really they are part of the disorder in Ithaca. This is reimagined um, in the Penelope ad, but we see it at the end of the Odyssey and it is quite grisly, and it does change some people's opinions of Odysseus. So Melantho is the central maid, the maid who is the mouthiest, the maid who is the most involved, 
Um, and there's some concern about the way that the maids in Ithaca have been interacting with the suitors all the way through. Is that seen as um, a lack of loyalty to Odysseus? Pardon me. Are they, um, are they kind of facilitating the suitors' pursuit of Penelope? Are they making them too welcome? Are they turning in their uh, loyalties? And again, for some people, they would compare Penelope and the, uh, the maids and say, well, hang on a minute, Penelope did what she needed to do to survive. Why shouldn't the maids do the same? But Odysseus purges the house of the maids at the end so that we're back to this ordered world. He asks the maid, well, he doesn't ask them, that's a ridiculous thing to say. He tells the maids to clear up the bodies of the suitors once the um, suitors have been killed. And I've highlighted some little chunks in here that are really gruesome to give you an impression of what a task this was for them. So they carried the bodies out. Remember, they're carrying the bodies of men, probably twice their weight, carrying the bodies of warriors. They're scraping the floor, so they're trying to scrape up blood. And so before the maids are killed, they are forced to clean up what is basically a battle scene in their own home. So Telemachus is the one who really rallies against the maids because he has been there all along. He has been growing up in a household where these women, who should have really been looking after him and his mum, have been too involved with the suitors. And it's really angered him. Remember, in the early parts of the Odyssey, towards the end of the Telemachy, there's a plot to kill Telemachus in the house, and the suitors hatch this plot. So Telemachus really associates the maids with the disorder, and they're good scapegoats. You know, once the suitors are done, once you're already angry, it's you can see how Telemachus wants to clear his household in a really gruesome way. So let it be by no clean death that I take the lives of these women who on my own head have poured reproaches and on my mother as they continually slept with the suitors. So Telemachus engineers the murder of the maids and Odysseus takes him at his word for it because he's the one who's been there all along. And so we see the gruesome hanging of the maids right at the very end of the Odyssey. They arrived a little while with their feet, but not for long. So it ends in a very dark note, but towards the end of the Odyssey, we have an underworld scene again with heroes from the Iliad. And right at the very end, in one of the books that I don't think is pres prescribed on our specification, Agamemnon talks about Clytemnestra. So although the um, murder of the maids is very grisly and very gruesome, we are reminded at the end of the epic about the dangers of having dis potentially disloyal women in your household. And Agamemnon is the cautionary tale for what can happen if you don't get your house in order. So conclusions then. Why did I choose to speak about women in the Odyssey today? Well, the women we meet are shaped by Odysseus's narrative. To some extent, the women are all plot devices, but they all raise different themes and they change our view of Odysseus. They're detaining women in the wanderings, and for Penelope in particular, and Eurycleia in particular, they're a reason to come home. They are what home is. The women in the middle belong to a disordered world and they are checked by Hermes. They don't have a kurios, they don't have an oikos, so Hermes has to get involved on both counts. They drive the plot, they tell us where Odysseus is going to go when he gets to stay, and they facilitate, in many ways, his, his um, ability to move around. They are the kind of gatekeepers of Odysseus's journey. And they're more than moral exemplar, they introduce really important themes, such as xenia and hospitality, like-mindedness with Odysseus, um, things like the Homeric question become important when we look at these women because of the order in which they are introduced. For example, we always compare the other women that we meet to Penelope. They represent different ages, classes and communities. That's another thing that's quite strong. You know, when we think about ancient texts, we assume that the way that women are presented is always going to be out of touch or isn't going to be, um, you know, very representative. And certainly the values are very different from our own. But what the Odyssey does really well, actually, is introduces us to women who are very young, who are perhaps older, like Eurycleia who belong to different communities and have different standards and expectations. So women aren't typecast as one particular thing. We meet a really good variety of female characters in the Odyssey. And we certainly see that with Eurycleia at the end. 
So I promised today, before we have a look at any questions you might have got, I know it's going to be a bit weird to just hear my voice from the ether and not see me. <laughs> I promised to recommend some reading for you over summer. So if you wanted to read around uh, the Odyssey and see different perspectives and see some of the female characters there, Silence of the Girls is perhaps the obvious choice. That's been out for quite a while now. And that is actually based around the Iliad. So that is where you would meet Briseis, um, the concubine that Agamemnon and Achilles are arguing about. And that is based around the Iliad. You could read uh, The Penelopead by Margaret Atwood, quite a short read. It deals with the Odyssey and characters there. Natalie Haynes' Thousand Ships, again, goes back perhaps more to the Iliad and women in the Iliad. Circe is the obvious one. And again, that's been out for over a year now. So maybe some of you have read that in lockdown and Trek yourselves. It's a really good insight into how women would live outside of a community and a society the way that um, Circe and Calypso do. You could also have a little look at Women of Troy. Now, this is coming out in August and you can pre-order it at the moment. So it's a sequel by Pat Barker. I assume that this will pick up um, a little bit where Silence of the Girls left off, but I just thought I should put it on your radar because it's quite a new one coming out. Okay, so thank you. Um, for sitting really patiently and listening to a voice from the speakers. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions or anything you want to ask, uh, just let me know. Thanks.